A lot of people think that because gold doesn't have a coupon or a dividend, it's an asset without a yield. But if you go back to 1971, since that time, on a compound annual growth rate basis, gold has returned 7.5%. It's an uncorrelated asset, not a positive relationship or a negative relationship. That means that it's giving you a level of diversification within the portfolio that few other assets can match. I'm George Milling Stanley, Head of Gold Strategy at State Street Global Advisors. If you can, cast your mind back to the summer of 1972, and if it helps you to picture this, I had an afro at the time. A lot of things have changed since then. Um, I was a reporter on a magazine in London, financial magazine, and the editor came to my door and he said, George, it's been 12 months since President Nixon closed the gold window. What do you think of that? And I looked up at him and said, I'm the faintest idea what you're talking about. I don't know what that means. He said, good, because I don't understand it either. I just read it somewhere. But if you and I don't understand it, that means our readers don't understand it either. Go find out about the gold market and write me a story. Um, and here we are 47 years later, still chasing the same story. I've been involved in gold in a lot of different ways since then. I spent uh, 10 years with the Financial Times writing about the gold mining industry, worked for a gold mining company running something that we called gold market intelligence. Then I uh, moved to this country to trade gold at uh, Shearson, which gradually became Lehman Brothers. Um, they closed down their physical commodity operations in uh, the mid-1990s. I went to work for something called the World Gold Council, which is a promotional organization financed by the gold mining company, so back to that uh, area, if you like. And most of what I was doing there was uh, advising central banks on how they manage the whole reserve portfolio, but with particular reference to, uh, to the role gold can or should play in the management of reserves. And then after 15 years there, I uh, set up my own little consultancy and thought I was gradually going to wind down until I was working three days a week and then two days a week and then suddenly no days a week. But State Street at the time was my biggest client and they said we'd like you to come on board, set up a team around the world and transfer your knowledge to them and work, your way, work yourself out of a job in the next five to ten years. So that's four years ago. I checked last week to make sure that the ten-year option's still on the table. I'm having a ball. I think you really need to look at, at the whole portfolio. I think that's really where you start from. And I'm not suggesting anybody should have 100% of their investments in gold or even 50%. The literature, the reliable literature, the good quality stuff, suggests that any portfolio could benefit from somewhere between 2 and 10% of the total as a strategic allocation. That's a pretty broad um, um, remit, if you like. Um, personally, I think that five makes a lot of sense for me and probably for a lot of other people, too. Um, we did a study, uh, uh, my, my team, my gold strategy team at State Street, did a study uh, two or three years ago where we were looking not at a 60-40 portfolio, because nobody has those anymore. We were looking at a global multi-asset portfolio with some exposure to obviously to stocks and bonds, but also to real estate, commodities, managed futures, various other different things. And we plugged in various different levels of, uh, of gold into that portfolio. We started with 2%, 5%, and 10%. And what we found was that at the 10% level, there was the biggest reduction in risk over the whole portfolio and the biggest increase in returns. So risk-adjusted returns were optimal at that 10% allocation to gold. That was the best sharp ratio that we found. Now, I don't walk into meetings and say to people, you've got to have 10% across all your portfolios, otherwise you're doing something wrong. What I say is, look, if you don't have any gold, try 2% and you will experience empirically the good things that a small allocation to gold can do for your portfolio. If you've got 2%, try 5 If you've got 5 why don't be brave and try 10 and see what that actually does for you. So that's broadly, I think, the reasons uh, why people ought to be interested. How does gold do this? Why does it succeed in reducing risk and increasing returns? I guess the first thing to say is that a lot of people think that because gold doesn't have a coupon or a dividend, it's an asset without a yield. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, 
But if you go back to 1971, which is the beginning of the free market in gold and also coincidentally the beginning of my experience of the gold market, since that time on a compound annual growth rate basis, gold has returned 7.5%. That's actually not too shabby for something that most people think doesn't actually have a return. So that's one thing. Gold does give you an absolute return, or it has done for the last 50 years or so. Um, secondly, gold doesn't really have a strong relationship with anything else in a portfolio, not a positive relationship or a negative relationship. It's an uncorrelated asset, as the, uh, as the e economists call it. That means that it's giving you a level of diversification within the portfolio that few other assets can match. Third, gold is a huge market. It's very deep and liquid. It's dominated by the over-the-counter market, people-to-people, principle-to-principle, rather than the futures exchanges, which is where most financial assets are actually traded on the futures exchange. Gold's unlike them, completely different from them. So a very, very deep and liquid market, turning over, according to the most recent studies, in excess of $100 billion a day. That's the whole gold market. Now, that's dwarfed by treasuries, but then everything's dwarfed by the treasury market. It, but it isn't that far behind Japanese government bonds. It's comfortably ahead of the UK gilts market or the German Bund market or any other government bond market you care to, to, to mention. So I think gold kind of earns its place in the mainstream on liquidity grounds as well. And then finally, um, the overall impact on the portfolio. I've already mentioned the sharp ratio. I've mentioned that gold can help to improve risk-adjusted returns, and that can be demonstrated. Gold also has thousands of years of a track record. You can't say that about every asset. You can't say it about Bitcoin, for example. Gold has thousands of years of a track record as offering some protection against the unexpected, whether your tail risk is macroeconomic in nature or geopolitical. So its portfolio impact is beneficial. Those, I think, are the, the main reasons why people ought to be interested if they're not. I do look at everything through the prism of gold, but I try to look at everything that's going on in financial markets and geopolitically as well, because that can be very important in terms of moving the gold price. A little bit of history to try and give some perspective to, to where we are today. If you go back to 2001, the gold price was at $250 an ounce. It had been there for several years with no great pressures to the upside or downside. It seemed, given all the circumstances, that was a pretty good equilibrium level for the gold price back in 2000. But that was about the time that the emerging markets embarked on this extraordinary period of economic expansion and with a general sense of, of, um, pr of profitability, a general sense of well-being throughout all of the emerging markets, led by China, but throughout all of the emerging, emerging markets as well. And people in the emerging market countries, when they feel prosperous, then they buy gold jewelry. So they were increasing their purchases of gold jewelry for the next decade from 2001 onward, and the gold price in consequence is going up very, very steadily. From 2001, the spring, until the fall of 2010, gold went up on average $100 a year. So that by the fall of 2010, we've gone from $250 an ounce to $1,250 an ounce. And it was at that point that the hot money speculators, the hedge funds, some of the trend-following speculators, momentum traders, noticed that gold had gone up $1,000 in just a decade, felt that it still had some momentum, so they piled in. They bought gold ETFs, they bought gold futures, they bought gold mining stocks as a proxy for the gold price. Um, they even, in some cases, were buying physical gold. And um, they took this market that's gone up very steadily based on sound fundamentals for a decade. It's gone up $100 a year on average, and they drove the price up $500 in just nine months. Now, clearly, uh, in any market, when that sort of um, price surge happens, it's completely divorced from the underlying realities of the asset, gold in our case, and it's going to end in tears. You know that if any, any price curve goes vertical like that, it's, it's going to end. There were a lot of people had a declared target of $2,000 an ounce. It's always kind of interesting to think of a, a new big figure in a, in, a, in a market. Some people were saying $5,000 an ounce, and I think there were some uh, other people even suggesting as much as 10000 I was being very quiet on the subject at this point because I was starting to get worried. The faster we went up and the further we went up, the more I was starting to get anxious as to when all this was going to end. 
Um, in fact, gold finished uh, just shy of the $2,000 mark. It, it topped out at $1,895 an ounce. And that's when the early adopters of this, uh, this speculative run started to take their profits. It took the hot money another year and a half to make its final exit. I would date that final exit at the spring of 2013. And lo and behold, I, th I think these were people who were still hoping for a last surge in the price to get through the $2,000 figure, and they're probably people who paid more than $1,800 to get in, desperately looking for some profit out of the thing. But they gave up the ghost. By the spring of 2013, um, the hot money is gone to play in other areas of the markets, and lo and behold, gold's back at $1,250 an ounce. So in the almost six years since that point, we've oscillated relatively narrowly around that $1,250 an ounce level. So I would suggest um, that the evidence uh, points to that being the new equilibrium level. So uh, an equilibrium level five times where we were at the beginning of this century. That's actually, again, that's not bad growth um, if you discount some of the speculative froth that got into the market in 2011. So we've been trading between about 1,150 on the bottom, 1,350 at the top, and moving from the bottom to the top and back to the bottom and so on, just basically range trading within that $200 barrier. There have been occasional moves outside of those parameters, but they weren't sustained, so I'm going to regard them as outliers and I'll, I'll ignore them if you'll let me. So trading range 1,150 to 1,350. We examined the downside very thoroughly last year. We got down to 1,166. I think that was a very thorough examination of support, and the support held up very solidly indeed, in spite of a lot of pressures on, on the gold price. So I'm guessing that we've already had one, att one attempt this year at the 1,350 resistance area. I'm expecting to have more attempts at that, and at some point I think that we're going to break through and we'll break out to the upside. That certainly is the way that the markets are looking at the moment, um, with gold solidly in the top half of my trading range above 1,250. We're currently around about the $1,300 uh, level. I think we examined the downside last year for two main reasons. The US equity market was incredibly strong, um, and the dollar was incredibly strong. And those were both putting downward pressure on the gold price for much of last year. But I think the equity markets were strong in the aftermath of the Trump tax cuts, and I think that there's no way that those are going to be repeated in 2019. So I'm looking for a lot more volatility in the equity market with potentially a bias toward the downside. And similarly with the dollar, the dollar was supported by four successive rate increases last year. And Jerome Powell, head of the FOMC, has made it clear that, that the dollar is not going to get the support of multiple rate hikes in 2019. So I'm expecting the dollar to be a lot more volatile and potentially to have some downside bias as well. So I think two major headwinds for the gold price have been removed, which is going to allow the gold price to, uh, to appreciate, in my view. And range trading markets do this. They'll test the downside. They'll test the upside. I'm expecting further examination of the upside. Um, and while I say this, I'm looking for modest gains to get into trying to attack that, that overhead resistance. But I'm acutely conscious of the fact that the hot money is not involved in gold at this point. In fact, the hot money has only just uh, covered the, the short selling that they had been doing for most of last year. And it is always possible that the hot money is going to get interested in gold again. If you think about it, the speculators made out like bandits in 2011 into 12, and they're looking to do the same again uh, at the first sign that gold is building some momentum of the similar kind uh, to what it did in 2010. Now, I'm not going to promise that when the speculators come back in, they'll drive the price up $500 in nine months again, but that is a real-world example of the power that the speculators can have over the gold market in the short term. The industry is under constant cost pressure. There's no question about that. If you go back a few years, when, um, when crude oil was at $130 a barrel, uh, the industry was under very serious pressure because energy amounts for more than half of the total costs of any mining operation, and gold is just the same as any other mining operation for that. 
the collapse in, in uh, energy prices that we've experienced over the last few years has certainly helped the gold mining industry back into profitability, but we're starting to see some signs of, uh, uh, of a resurgence in energy prices again for a whole bunch of different reasons, and I think that uh, that is going to put the industry under cost pressures again. The average cost of producing an ounce of gold from gold mines around the world is somewhere between $1,000 and $1,100, which means that the people at the bottom end of the cost curve, the more efficient producers with the better deposits, are doing fine. They're producing for less than $1,000. They have a reasonable profit margin. But this is a global average, so there's a lot of people who are above that uh, global average in terms of their costs. There's not really much of a cushion there, um, and uh, these are the people that I think are coming in increasingly under pressure. The other thing to say is that the, the gold mining industry has figured out that the business they're in is not producing gold. The business they're in is producing profits for their shareholders and for their management. Um, and they are looking very, very carefully at the way their production unfolds and the way it develops to be sure that they're not producing a single ounce that doesn't make a profit. So the bigger and smarter producers are saying, we're going to produce less gold and more profits. Um, that, I think, is going to mean that, uh, that we will see um, probably very gradual reductions in mine production, not, not falling off a cliff, but gradual reductions in mine production going forward. So that if the supply is likely to be declining, um, let's look at the demand side. Since all of the dislocations in financial markets in 2008 and 9, and the gold market dislocations of 2011 to 12, we have seen a resurgence in economic growth in the emerging markets. I know that we get an occasional quarter when there's a downturn, but the general trend over the past five, six years or so has been for China to grow at five, six, or seven percent. We'd give our eye teeth to do that, so would Europe, so would Japan which is helping to support gold jewelry demand again throughout the emerging world. Not as strong as it was from 2001 to 2010, but nevertheless pretty solid growth every year. And even when we get an economic downturn, gold jewelry demand has been holding very, very steady in China, in India, throughout the emerging world. So that's good support. But increasingly, we're seeing um, investors emerge in the emerging markets. We're seeing a significant increase in pure investment demand alongside the jewelry demand. And that, I think, is a relatively new term in the equation. That is also, I think, going to be a catalyst for higher prices going forward. When we look at the rest of the world, we look at Europe, North America, We've got two very distinct kinds of investment demand going on there. Safe haven buying, people are concerned macroeconomically, people are concerned geopolitically. I don't think we need to go into all the details of that. There is a level of uncertainty that, uh, that some people would suggest is actually unprecedented in markets right now. So safe haven buying of gold makes a lot of sense for people who are concerned about uh, about the potential for a stock market decline, um, the potential for political tensions to, uh, to, to increase trade wars, whatever. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems on the horizon. And outside of this country, you've got the whole issue of Brexit and Germany coming to terms with the transition from Mrs. Merkel to whatever comes after Mrs. Merkel, which is, which is proving a little difficult for them to absorb. So you've got this solid safe haven buying, which I think is providing good support to gold prices. But in addition, Again, this is in the period after all of the um, dislocations of 2008 and 2012 passed away. Um, the dust settled from them. We've seen um, significant strategic asset allocation type buying from both institutions and individuals, putting somewhere between 2 and 10 percent into their properly balanced global multi-asset portfolios because they know it improves their sharp ratio, it increases their risk-adjusted returns. All of that together, you've got um, flat to declining supply, you've got modest but nevertheless important growth on the demand side. That's a pretty good recipe, um, given that the exogenous variables also, to my mind, seem to be pretty favorable in terms of um, macroeconomic tensions, geopolitical tensions.
You're asking me what keeps me awake at night as far as gold is concerned. And I have to answer that gold is what allows me to sleep at night. It allows me to push further out on the risk spectrum in my equities into more growth stocks and to be a little more aggressive in terms of higher yield on the bond side because I know that, that my portfolio has a pretty solid core that is going to perform and is going to perform even better if and when all those other things turn down. But it's going to perform whether they turn down or not. So gold is what allows me to sleep at night. I think something would have to go wrong with most of the factors that I think lie behind the rise in uh, what I expect to be the continued rise in gold prices. Something would have to go wrong with more than just one of these. You'd have to see um, a significant surge in the value of the dollar, and I'm not expecting that anytime soon. I think the Europeans will get their act together. I'm not going to give you a time frame on that. That would be foolish. Um, but I think they will get their act together, and the euro will reemerge as a, as a decent currency and as some competition uh, for the dollar. I think increasingly the renminbi from China is emerging as it's, 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 it's competing in the sense that um, the IMF has allowed the renminbi into the special drawing rights, um, and that's kind of a, a seal of approval, if you like, from the IMF for central banks around the world, if they choose, to include the renminbi in their official reserves, which has not really happened very much, but I think is increasingly going to be happen. So I think we're moving away from a period of um, where the dollar was king and then nothing else really counted in international monetary system to a period where we're going to have multiple reserve assets, just as we did when we had sterling and the dollar and gold, all three coexisting. When the euro was first launched, the euro then took its, its, uh, its turn and played into a, a multi-asset international monetary system, if you like. More recently, dollar dominance has, has re-emerged. But as I say, I think that we, we are already seeing the renminbi starting to move. Governments are issuing uh, bonds denominated in ren. The UK government did that not that long ago. I mean, to me, with my accent, that's obviously the ultimate seal of approval. Um, so you're going to see more of that kind of thing happening. You're going to see the renminbi paying more of a role. You will eventually see the euro play more of a role. And I think that gold will also play more of a role because it is a, a, a tradition that when you have a proper multi-asset system, then gold does play more of a role in the international monetary system and in the system of foreign exchange reserves in banks. Gold uh, is viewed as a currency. One other thing I didn't mention in terms of um, supply and demand was that it's not just the private sector in the emerging markets that are big buyers of gold. Emerging market central banks have been net buyers now for a decade of the equivalent of about 10% of each year's demand, which is very significant. And last year, they upped their purchases to the largest since that magic date of 1971, the birth of the free market in gold. They bought more gold than at any time since 1971 last year, accounting for about 15% of final demand. Um, and those purchases are continuing this year. So I think we've got very, very solid support as far as, the, uh, as, far as that's concerned. India has a problem um, with government interference in the gold business. They had kind of left the gold business alone for a very long period of time once they freed up the market in the 1990s, but they became very worried a few years back about a significant current account deficit, so they looked at the causes behind outflows of hard currency. Energy was number one because India doesn't have domestic oil supplies, for example. So energy was the biggest single uh, reason for current hard currency outflows. That's a necessity. You can't do anything about that. But gold, they determined, was the second biggest reason for currency outflows. And they decided gold was a luxury, so they put all kinds of onerous taxes and tariffs and import duties and all sorts of things on it, which didn't really cut back on gold consumption very much. They just turned it um, back to the black market. Smuggling picked up again. There were well established smuggling routes that had been supplying India up until India opened its markets in the 1990s. It was very, very simple to reopen those routes again so that the outflows of currency continued. They don't seem to have the current account deficit problem that they had before, but governments are notoriously reluctant to give up on anything that is revenue generating, even if the 
initial reason for imposing these, these taxes and tariffs is gone. So they are gradually unwinding this structure, but it's taking a long time. It's messing with the statistics. It's messing with the, with the industry as a whole, which is part of the reason why China has overtaken India by far as the largest single consumer. India is still second, so it's still very important. Um, but China, because of, its, um, because of its own economic progress and because of government interference in India, um, has, has assumed the number one role. We ignore China at our peril. China is the biggest single producer of gold from its gold mines, and it's the biggest single consumer of gold because it is, relative to even 20 years ago, an extremely prosperous country these days. And the prosperity seems to be spreading from the ruling classes all the way down through the demographic. And I think that that is uh, an amazing development, lifting people out of poverty. If you look at China's track record on that, it has been immense. Um, and you can actually see it if you go and visit there. There are young people dressed smartly, going into Louis Vuitton and Apple stores and buying the latest things the way people do in this country. But they're also going into the 24 karat gold jewelry stores and buying without any apparent, any sense of disconnect at all. They're buying the same kind of gold jewelry that their grandparents and great grandparents before them bought as well. And that I think is a very, very interesting development. The young people continuing to buy the same kind of gold jewelry. So how should people gain access to this, the benefits that this amazing market can bring them? Look, for the longest time, people bought the stocks of gold mining companies as a proxy for the gold price. But since we launched GLD back in 2004, they can buy the gold price, because that's essentially what GLD is. It's the gold price, but traded on a stock exchange. So it shows up in your regular statement from your broker, rather than having to go to a futures account or having to buy physical gold and then insure it and figure out how and where to store it safely and so on. So GLD basically takes the... Uh, uh, the aches and pains out of doing that. There will always be people who want to have their gold in their own possession. And I'm not immune. There's a visceral appeal to gold that I'm, I know too. Um, I have handfuls of gold coins, but I keep them in the bedside drawer next to the flashlight and next to the life insurance policies rather than regarding my gold coins as part of my exposure to gold. That's through ETFs because they're a very, very efficient vehicle to do it. So people don't need to buy gold mining companies as a proxy for the gold price. So now people are judging gold mining mining companies on the basis of their performance, which I think is a very healthy development to judge the ones who are doing well compared to the ones who are, not, who are doing less well. So I think that is a much fairer environment. And as I say, buying physical gold, buying your own, go your own coins or bars, you then do have the issue of uh, how do you store it? Do you need a firearm? Do you need a, a wall safe or, or what, what do you need? Um, you probably need very good insurance as well, whereas an ETF just takes away all of the problems of that. One thing I would say is that in the 47 years I've been involved in the gold business, it has never bored me. That's partly because I've looked at it from a whole bunch of different perspectives, but the subject in and of itself has been endlessly fascinating. When I started, I was 25 years old, um, and basically at that point, I think I knew all the answers. Now, so many years later, um, I just hope I'm asking the right people the right questions. I think that's really the way that I tend to look at gold right now. I'm learning an enormous amount every day simply by talking to financial advisors and talking to end investors, talking to other people involved in the business, talking to reporters. Uh, it's a never-ending process of learning, and that, I think, is what, uh, is what is keeping my attention. If gold ever loses my attention, I'll quit and retire and leave it to the next generation to take care of. But for the time being, I love being in the thick of it. I think probably the most important thing I've said is the, the four major pillars of the strategic case for gold. One, gold does give you a return. It's small, but it is nevertheless a return, and it is perfectly reasonable to have that. Two, uh, that, uh, that gold doesn't really correlate with anything else in a typical portfolio, so it's diversification, it's spreading your risk. Three, it's a very deep and liquid market. You can transact in size without moving the price, as many people have discussed. Covered. That is, an, in and of itself, a very great benefit. And finally, the impact on your portfolio. 
helping to mitigate tail risk, helping to mitigate unexpected events, and um, improving risk-adjusted returns. Those, I think, would be the four takeaways. Um, I know people only ever remember three things that you tell them, so I would, uh, I would hope that people would make an effort to remember a fourth, uh, to remember all four of those things.